introduce our speaker this evening, Sophie Andre. Um, but before then, just a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, in terms of toilets, if you require them, if you go out of the hall, turn to your right and down the corridor there. Should the fire alarm sound, uh, it would be directed either through the fire exit here or back the way you came up the stairs and we will leave the building and cross the street. Um, but let us hope and pray that that is not needed. Um, also, at the end, there's tea and coffee again, but also in the foyer of the uh, entrance here, there is a small stall, as it were, a display um, for our caring for our cathedral fundraising campaign. So I do uh, encourage you just to have a look at that, please. We are uh, uh, needing to raise funds to maintain the beauty of this particular Catholic church. And should you be interested, there is a cathedral guidebook and history for sale at five pounds. Um, it's possible to pay for those contacts. But once again, you are all very welcome. And we just begin with a prayer. And I take as our prayer the collect from the common of the dedication of a church from the Roman Missal which seemed fitting for this evening's theme of the glory of our Catholic churches. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, who from living and chosen stones prepare an eternal dwelling for your majesty, increase in your church the grace you have bestowed, so that by unceasing growth your faithful people may build up the heavenly Jerusalem through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of unfailing help, pray, pray for us. us. Saint Anne, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just say once again a very warm welcome to you at this second of our talks and um, the life. Transfigured series, a series which looks at the interface uh, between our Catholic faith and the arts. And um, it's great to be able to meet here physically. We're also recording this talk um, and it'll be online uh, tomorrow. So tonight we head to the world of architecture and we're extremely privileged to have with us Sophie Andre. Um, since 2002, Sophie has been Vice Chair of the Patrimony Committee for the Catholic Bishops' Conference, and she's currently Co-Chair of Historic England's Places of Worship Forum. Sophie has a wealth of experience in heritage and the built environment sector. Um, she's held a string of appointments with, for example, the Historic Royal Palaces, the National Trust, K, that's the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, the Georgian Group, and last uh, but not least, I should mention that she was one time chair of the Upper Dyke Association, uh, which betrays something of where she lives. She spends her time between England and Wales. So it's a delight to have you, and we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Move somewhere more central because there's lots of images to see, and I wouldn't want you to um, to, um, to, to to be missing out at all on this. Um, so I've been asked to talk about uh, Catholic um, architecture in this country, and it's a fascinating subject, and it's one that is really, I think, um, not Catholic churches in this country are really not as well known historically as, as as they should be. Uh, we all know about the great um, cathedrals and. Uh, uh, churches of, 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 of Europe, of Germany, of you know, France, and of course of Italy. Um, and um, I would just sort of say by way of beginning, back in 2006, I project managed a book which some of you may have seen, which then English Heritage and Historic England published called A Glimpse of Heaven. 
And when we were working on it, the whole idea was to illustrate uh, historic uh, Catholic churches in England and Wales. And I can remember you know, some really incredibly um, knowledgeable Catholics saying to me, well, that's going to be a very slim volume, so it's a question of the cathedral and yeah, what else is there. Yeah. And um, actually, you know, we could have produced the, the book of Mr. Packard, and um, we could have done a book three times the size, frankly. And there's still so much to be discovered, rediscovered about the architecture of, of Catholic churches. So this evening, it is a glimpse of heaven. That's what you're going to see, I hope. And um, so to sort of kick off, really, um, just by, a, um, again, by way of introduction, like, just keep in your mind, really, the enormous range of styles that Catholic churches, they come in all shapes and sizes and all, all styles as well. And we'll see a little bit of that um, this evening. Um, so just to sort of kick off, I want to set this in context. We have to remember that for over 200 years, between the accession of Elizabeth I and um, the, uh, the, the first Catholic Relief Act, the sale of mass was illegal, and Catholics, as you know, could be imprisoned and indeed um, um, martyred for their faith. Um, so that's the sort of the starting point, and so architecture in terms of Catholic churches in this country really kicks off in a sort of more public sense. Um, the story really begins with the first Catholic Relief Act in 1778, which uh, allowed for the first time since the accession of Elizabeth um, priests and bishops to say mass uh, without fear um, of prosecution. That didn't really mean, it certainly didn't mean they could say it in public, um, but, the, but those, those initial, that initial Catholic Relief Act um, allowed, uh, you know, allowed relief from, 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 from prosecution. And then of course it wasn't that long after that, uh, the anti-Catholic feeling um, that, that followed that in, in 1780, a uh, key date, you had the Gordon Riots, where the first emerging chapels, and indeed houses belonging to prominent Catholics, really in all the sort of major cities, tended to get torched and burnt, including a number of the embassy chapels in, in London. So, so you know, that, that's in, in 1780. And the next sort of date we're just sort of thinking about is 1788, which was the date that, um, the year that um, Ronnie Prince Charlie died, and that really took away the sort of threat of, of, of a Stuart succession. So that's kind of quite important. He had his brother, who was, of course, the Cardinal um, um, uh, of York, uh, but, but he remained living, living, in, um, living in Italy, and then it would never have been a, a threat, in a sense, to the, to the, to the British throne. Um, so 1788, and then in 1789, the French Revolution, and with all the anti-clericalism that followed that, and a huge influx of particularly French priests uh, to England, um, and combined with that, an increasing numbers of Irish particularly fighting the British armies and so forth. And there was a gradual feeling that really something needed to be done in terms of emancipating um, Catholics, which doesn't help. First of all, you look at the, um, the key date of 1791, which I'll come on to, which was the main Catholic Relief Act, and then finally, emancipation in 1829. Um, I'm not going to go into the hidden chapels of the sort of penal period. Um, I'm really going to focus on, on churches today and chapels that were sort of um, actually sort of open um, in the sense for, 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 for public worship. And um, to begin with, they are actually all hidden chapels, um, but they are in a way quite different from. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew this had happened. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been sitting quietly, yes. that's what's yes. happened, it's, it's turned itself off. So the first of these um, chapels I want to show you is the chapel at Warder Castle in Wiltshire. And um, so it's interesting really by the end of the 18th century, prominent Catholics, uh, aristocrats, could actually be pretty open about their faith. And many of them are educated abroad. Um, the uh, the um, um, eighth Baron Arundel of Warder, educated at Santa Omer by the Jesuits, comes back, um, goes to Rome, you'll see in a minute, um, and collects lots of artworks, comes back, appoints James Payne, the Palladian architect, to build Warder Castle. And this is the entrance to the immensely grand chapel that he constructed in 1776. So it's very hidden. You, 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 you don't have to be a door to, to anywhere, really. It could be, you know, it just could be a door to servants' quarters, but actually what it is the door to. Um, oh dear, I'm going home again. Eventually, there we go. And that's the door to the chapel of Warder which is a, just extraordinarily grand, um, uh, um, it's just an astonishing interior. 
And as I say, you know, he went to Rome with uh, the, the Jesuit who had been his tutor, and they were busy in Rome buying uh, the altarpiece, the altar, um, as you can see there. Um, I'm going to press the wrong one, we'll get there eventually. Um, there we go, wonderful, wonderful marble altar. And, um, and this is sort of detail, that's the private um, pew of the 8th um, Baron Arundel. Uh, there's a detail of the ceiling. Um, and, then, and then objects within the chapel, uh, such as this magnificent um, Italian relief. Um, so I mean, that's, as I say, just, just um, 1776. Um, and, then, and then sort of moving on a bit, um, 1786, you get this little chapel in the grounds of Lulworth Castle. So this is the Wells uh, family seat, um, again in the West Country, and uh, feeling sort of confident enough to build a separate chapel. This is so freestanding, um, and really one of the first in 1786. And it wasn't that far from Weymouth, and uh, George III visited um, the Wells and said, well, look, it's all right, you can build yourself a chapel, but it mustn't look like a chapel. So what does this look like? It's really sort of hiding, is it a mausoleum? Is it a, is it a banqueting house, a garden building of some sort? You wouldn't immediately think that that was a, a, a place of Catholic worship. But inside, very simple, very elegant, uh, very, very, very stylish um, interior. And so a number of recusant uh, families, long-established recusant families, start to build these freestanding uh, chapels or indeed churches. So a little bit later, this is 1816, this is All Saints, in Hassop, in Derbyshire, built by the Eyre family. And uh, um, you can see here that the Eyre family um, are, in terms of style, they're looking at Inigo Jones, because this is very relevant, this facade of Jones's um, great church in Covent Garden. And so there's a sort of hint here, Jones obviously was you know, the first sort of brings Palladianism into England um, and Palladian design, so here we have you know, this is all sort of redolent of ancient Rome, but it's also Jones as an English architect who brings classicism to England. So there's a lot of interesting sort of mix here of saying, um, you know, here we are building a Catholic church, but it is very much an English, an English building, an English-inspired building. And um, but yet the interior is the interior of um, All Saints Hassop. Again, the altar. Um, I, I don't know how well you can see it here, but it's a Baroque altar, marble Baroque altar, brought from Italy. So all the way through, you get this kind of emphasis on bringing things from Italy, usually from Rome, but, but otherwise marble altars and, and, and artifacts and so forth um, uh, from, from, from Italy. And then here's another one, and it's a little bit later, this is 1836, we're still in the world of private chapels. This is Everingham Hall, and the chapel of Everingham uh, in, uh, it's actually Yorkshire, isn't it? It's, not, it's Yorkshire. Um, 1836, built by Constable Maxwell's. But again, you know, is that really a place of Catholic worship? It's certainly owing a lot to Rome, um, and the interior is quite remarkable. And this is a private chapel on a private estate. And uh, um, I mean, those saints um, have been carved in Rome, but um, they almost look like they could be Roman emperors, couldn't they? But this is a real, um, a real homage to, to, to Rome, um, and so on. Um, but so there's just a sort of, um, a number of the private, privately built um, chapels by major Catholic landowners. But the next sort of key date sort of holding your mind is 1791, uh, when the Catholic Relief Act, the main Catholic Relief Act is passed, which actually makes it possible uh, for the first time for um, the churches to be built in, in, in public places and actually open for public worship. And this is one of the first. This is um, St. Thomas of Canterbury. Uh, in Newport, in the Isle of Wight. And the Isle of Wight, interestingly, I mean, everyone knows about the north of England having you know, strong heartlands of reticency, but actually the Isle of Wight also was a strongly reticent place um, throughout the penal period. And so 1791, you know, the act is passed, and a, and a rich widow um, called Elizabeth Hennage um, pays for this church, and she also paid for the, a very similar church, uh, sadly rather altered since, but in, in Cairo's. And, um, and so, you know, this is, so what is this? What, you know, in terms of style, what are we kind of looking at here? I think apart from spotting the crosses, um, um, both on the, um, on the pediment and on the little porch, you might just think that was a little Methodist chapel, a little brick Methodist chapel. So it's very self-effacing. Um, you know, the Gordon riots weren't all that long ago, and there was always the fear of the mob. Um, and actually, another point about Catholic churches, they can often be in sort of side streets and rather hidden away, and often with rather plain exteriors, hiding um, rather amazing interiors. It's another reason why they're less well known than they should be. 
Um, but, but this little gem, as I say, is one of the earliest surviving um, Catholic um, churches for public worship. But um, not, not sort of not that much later, we sort of move on, confidence is growing, uh, Catholicism is pretty strong in the Northwest. Uh, this is St. Mary's Wigan of 1818, and it's really quite a large church, and you can see here, moving on from the sort of ancient Roman, we begin the Battle of the Styles, and here we have a, a, an essay in, in, in Gothic, um, but it's rather in the sort of um, Strawberry Hill type, more fanciful Gothic than we're going to see later with Pugin. Uh, who's really going back to the medieval period and trying to be as authentic as he possibly can be to the sort of medieval, his idea of the medieval um, I, you know, ideals. Um, so that's Wigan. And then we move to Hereford. And uh, this is 1838, Charles Day, designing this really strongly sort of neoclassical uh, um, church. And it's only yards actually from, the, from, not from Hereford Cathedral. This is right in the centre of Hereford, right by the cathedral. Very, very well the statement, built for the Jesuits, and it's a, you know, it's, it's a crossing complete contrast uh, to the normal and medieval cathedral. And again, you know, it's shades of, 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 of ancient of, of Rome. And there's the interior um, with actually the, um, the, the the tabernacle and so forth, um, based on on uh, St Peter's. Um, this particular church very nearly closed. It had a terrible dry rot about 20 years ago, and the um, Archdiocese of Cardiff was actually going to sell it, and there was a real fear it was actually going to get turned into some form of, of shop or supermarket, but local people um, made a huge fuss, it wasn't closed, and they got a heritage lottery fund grant. It's been very, very beautifully restored and is very much um, in, in use. Um, but then moving on, and we're going to now just sort of go through a number of the kind of principal Catholic architects. Now, the Victorian Catholic architects are generally far less well known than the, the, the ones that were designing, you know, whether it was Scott um, um, or, 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 or um, when, and it was um, Gilbert Scott, and then were people like Street and um, Butterfield, the well known Victorian architects were designing big Anglican churches. And by contrast, the Catholic architects who tended to, you know, to be the much lower key and they tend not to be as well known, but obviously the one that everybody does know is Augustus a wealthy North North Pugin. And one of the reasons Pugin is so well known um, was because of course his books, his publications, and particularly the one called Contrast, which he published, which sort of illustrated really the, the whole industrial revolution in England and life in, in, in England um, at, at the period he was doing this was, was all ghastly and the poverty and everything else, in contrast to um, the perfection of the medieval period, in particular the monasteries looking after people, and it's all a series of engravings showing you know, what life is, he perceived it was like in, in, in medieval England with life in Victorian um, um, England and this business of contrast and essentially arguing that the only form of architecture for any kind of ecclesiastical building or any building basically was Gothic. Um, this, was, this was the inherent architecture of Northern Europe. He loathed the whole idea of classicism and thought it was pagan and, and wrote passionately about it. And actually on one occasion when some um, vestments were given, Roman vestments were given, wonderful um, Baroque vestments were given to Ashall College and he designed the chapel for Ashall College. He forbade them to be used, but he couldn't bear the thought of these Roman vessels <laughs> being used in his chapel. So he was, he was very difficult, very passionate, and hugely, hugely influential. So this is St Mary's Derby, which was his first major church, and um, this is 1838. Um, he worked himself to death, as you probably all know, and obviously he's also known for the Houses of Parliament and, 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 and working with Barry on all the Gothic detail there. But a very classic type of Pugin feature, um, this kind of rude um, arrangement, um, uh, um, sort of, you know, in, 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 like a sort of medieval rude screen, um, but obviously with the crucifixion and so forth. And then there's another really major commission, it's St. Chad's in Birmingham, which is 1839. And, you know, you might think this looks a bit Scandinavian or a bit German. And it's very conscious by Pugin, he's doing this so that this church stands out and looks completely different from every other church um, in Birmingham at the time, and in particular the, um, the main parish church and the cathedral in, in the Anglican Cathedral in Birmingham. Um, so he'd already designed Oscott by this stage, and here he is designing St. Chad's. And uh, there we have the interior, again, um, this, tall, this tall nave, and it's got a big focus um, on, on the high altar, and in particular on this astonishing um, arrangement of the, the reliquary of St. Chad's bones above the tabernacle. 
and they have recently been rediscovered St. Chad's Bones, the wonderful story which is depicted by Hardman in the stained glass, and they were found in a sort of box of a, a Tudor four-post event. They've been there for a very long time, and um, I can't remember the name of the, the family that the owner of the old was dying, and as he's dying breath, he said to his son, you know, mind got the box above here, it's really, really important, these are the bones of St. Chad, which have been hidden for all that time, and because um, they were originally in Litchfield um, Cathedral and were removed at the Reformation, and there they are um, in that remarkable reliquary. But um, one can't get away from the really incredibly powerful influence um, that Pugin was, um, the influence he had. And of course, this is worth saying, it wasn't just his influence here. His drawings and things were going out to places like Australia, and, um, and actually some of the, the, the early Catholic churches in Australia are, are very Pugin-esque and, and, and so forth. So you know, he has this really astonishing influence. But his great church of St. Giles in Cheadle, 1840, so a little bit later, and this is his great patron was the 16th Earl of Shrewsbury, immensely wealthy, um, who, who funded a lot of Catholic churches at this period, and, and really was, was Pugin's key patron, um, and, and put up with him because they were always having arguments about whether there should be a root screen or whether there shouldn't, and where the organ should go, and this sort of thing. But at, 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 at Cheadle, which was a, a, the, the estate church for um, the Shrewsbury's uh, estate, um, uh, he was really given free reign and could do what he liked. And of course, the Earl of Shrewsbury put a huge amount of money into building this church. And every inch of it is painted. Um, and, and in a way, um, I mean, Putin himself referred to this church, and he would refer to it as Ch Cheadle, perfect Cheadle. He was allowed really to do, to do what he wanted um, and to re recreate, in his view, his idea of the medieval church, which, as we know, they were all painted, they were highly coloured. Um, and and you know, this is the kind of detail. And if you go there, if you've not been there, I do encourage you to go. But it, what's, what's wonderful, it's not overlit, it's not too bright. You go into this sort of medieval gloom and you see these kind of astonishing colours and that sort of thing. Um, so that was Chilo. And then um, the other key building, I suppose, that um, and it's also key buildings that Fujin, Fujin designs, but um, he, he bought land at Ramsgate to be near, to be near um, where St. Augustine landed before going to Canterbury. And then he built himself his own house, the Grange, which is now belongs to the Landmark Trust, and you can go and stay there. And then immediately next door, he built his own church, funded it himself, designed it obviously himself, never quite finished it. He died before um, it was complete, and it was finished off by his son, who then built the cloister, and, and well, actually he built the cloister, but other bits and pieces, his son, Edward uh, Pugin, um, finished off. But here was Pugin's idea, this is the church, um, and he wanted to, to, you know, to, to create, a, effectively, a, um, um, a monastic community. Um, monks came after he died. Um, uh, here's, his, here's his tomb, he's buried there. And this is the most remarkable place. And uh, they've been very recently restored with a major uh, lottery fund grant. Um, and um, is a real jewel, actually, well worth, well worth going to see. Um, it's, a, it's a magnificent place, but very much embodies everything that, that Pugin um, stood for. But he wasn't the only exponent of the Gothic. And um, moving on, I'm just going to talk about some key architects. Um, here we have the Jesuit Church of Farm Street in Mayfair in London. And so you know, a really key major church in the centre of London. And this is designed by J.J. Scholes, who was very much favoured by the Jesuits and built quite a number of their, their churches. And you see it's a very different kind of Gothic to what I've just shown you with Pugin. Um, it lacks the kind of highly coloured in, you know, in, in, in interior finishes that you see at Chino. Um, and it's, it's, but it's still an incredibly beautiful, very, very well executed um, a composition. Here's the, here's the, um, the aisle. Um, and he, in Skulls went on to design a, a number of really important and um, highly graded historic churches. Um, another key figure, um, probably better known than the Skulls, is uh, Joseph Aloysius Hansen who also built numerous churches uh, around the country, some for the Jesuits, but many for um, the emerging diocese and so forth. And uh, this is Holy Name in Manchester. Uh, it's directly opposite the university now. Um, the, the upper part of that tower actually is quite a lot later. It's 1928 by Adrian Gilbert Scott. Um, but this is one of Joseph Hansen's finest uh, churches. Um, and there is the interior. And here is another one um, of the interior, incredibly highly detailed, very, very beautiful, very atmospheric building indeed. And um, Hansom, actually, as well as being a really important designer of Catholic churches, 
He was a man of many parts. Um, he also designed the handsome cab. And he also was the editor of a very important publication called The Builder, which ran all through the, um, the Victorian period, illustrated new buildings being built during the Victorian period, including churches. Wonderful research um, um, as, a, you know, as, a, as a document in terms of, of all sorts of buildings being built. It's a wonderful um, tool of research. Um, but, um, so he was a very prolific architect, many, many churches. I've just been to one today at, um, at Ripon's, the Wilfred is one of his, is one of his churches. Um, another of his great masterpieces is, is this church. So this is St. Walberg's in Preston. And this has the claim, also built originally for the Jesuits. Um, and this has the claim to claim the tallest spire of, of any church in Britain after Salisbury Cathedral. And there it stands, um, there it is in the skyline in Preston, here it is again. Uh, the most remarkable building, it is enormously tall. And I want you to just sort of keep that particular picture in your mind until we get to the very end, because I'm going to show you a picture of the roof, which we're currently granting its repair. Um, but, um, so why Preston? Preston has a number of really important Catholic churches, and it was because there were a lot of Catholics in Preston, and in some ways it maintained its Catholic culture throughout the penal period. So with emancipation uh, in 1829, uh, there was just a great move to build churches. Ch uh, Preston is full of really outstanding churches. This is the grandest and the biggest, St. Walberg's. Um, and there it is, um, there it is uh, on the, um, in, in Preston across, across the buildings. And um, there we have the West Front. And uh, I'll just again um, uh, point out the, the cross at the top, which is all in stone. And again, just, just bear that picture, the height of that in mind when we get to the very end of this, um, the Calvary at the top there. Um, and then the interior is just quite extraordinary. Um, so so um, what, what's also interesting about this is where Hansen differs really so fundamentally from Fusion. Fusion is trying to recreate the Gothic and to recreate the medieval and that sense of, 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 of mystery and that sense of, of you know, the screens, we always want to put in rude screens and this sort of thing, always having fights with his clients about that. Um, but here, what Hansen is doing is really interesting because he's created this hammer beam roof and filled it full of, um, filled it full of scents as they are there. But if I just go back to, to that image, so it, 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 it's essentially a sort of almost um, Roman design in the sense of the counter-reformation idea of the centrality of the Eucharist. And those of you who know the Jesu in Rome and how the focus on the, on the high altar was a counter-reformation idea um, to, to, to absolutely you know, to, 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 to instill this whole notion of the centrality of the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, the first thing you see when you go in through the, through the door of a church, not hidden by any screen, and having the, the breadth without aisles and this sort of thing. And so actually from an architectural point, this is really, really interesting. And, and hands on, and of course, the Victorian um, Anglican architects really despised this because they didn't understand it because it wasn't pure Gothic. Um, and actually, what Hansen is doing is taking essentially counter Reformation Roman ideas, Italian ideas, and into reinterpreting them here. Um, so there we have all these saints. And it's still got quite a lot of its Victorian statues. Um, it is remarkably complete, except in one important respect, which is that the, um, it did rather suffer post Vatican II when they ripped up the, uh, um, um, took out the marble altar rails and, and reconfigured, reconfigured uh, the sanctuary there. And the altar is really all that's left of the altar rails. They just sort of kept it, you know, turned it into the altar and put in that rather incongruous kind of white marble. Um, and I think most of the altar rails, um, there's the altar. I think there's quite a lot of broken bits of that somewhere in the crypts, and I think one day maybe they could be potentially re reinstated. Um, so that's Joseph Hansom, again, as I say, designer of many, many churches, but along with the Gothic, and indeed this kind of reinterpretation using the sort of counter reformation ideas, actually expanded by people like uh, St. Charles Borromeo about how a church should be um, configured and ordered, um, you still get. Uh, this, this looking to Rome, and of course the oratorians in particular look to Rome. Uh, this is the London Oratory, 1878. It is totally 100% Italian in its, in its, in its um, concept and in its design. Um, there's the high altar. I mean, you know, you, could, you, you, really, could, you really could be in Rome. And um, in fact, actually, here's the lady altar, where the entire, the entire edifice of this um, altar uh, was brought from Russia in Italy. Uh, the marble, um, you know, the, 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 all the metal details of the altar rails, the candelabra, everything, uh, and installed in this newly emerging church um, 
on Cromwell Road, very, very visible. I mean, there's no hiding away. This, this church is, you know, is, 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 is there to be seen and to be, you know, to be seen. Um, so there is the, uh, the view towards the sanctuary. As I say, it is, it is absolutely sort of purely Roman, but um, in its concept. But then, um, really, at sort of much the same sort of time, uh, you've got this. This is Norwich Cathedral, St John the Baptist, Norwich, and uh, this is George Gilbert Scott, so son of, of one of the, you know, the members of the Scott family um, of, um, of Gilbert Scott, it was Sir Gilbert Scott himself, and George Gilbert Scott actually converts to Catholicism um, because you know this is who had been building all these Anglican churches, but um, George Gilbert Scott converts, becomes a Catholic, and comes under the wing of the 15th Duke of Norfolk, who's the other key 19th century patron of Catholic churches. And the 15th Duke of Norfolk um, funds this astonishing cathedral in the middle of Norwich, I mean, really to be in competition with, uh, obviously, the Norman um, cathedral. And there's the interior, so you can see the sort of, you know, Norman-style, well, it's Gothic, because it's got lots of Norman-style columns there. This is 1884. And he, he builds this to celebrate um, his very happy marriage and so on. But this is a, you know, it is a, it is a real, it is a real masterpiece. Um, so there's a sort of number of sort of key Catholic architects. Um, this, the, as well as all of that going on, you get a lot of, as I call them, sort of one-offs in the Catholic Church in terms of Catholic churches. And this is one of them. Um, so this is the, uh, the front of St Charles Borromeo in Hull. And uh, the predecessor to this little um, frontage, a little chapel, the, um, uh, was actually one of the ones that did burn down, and it was burnt down in the Gordon riots. And uh, so this frontage is actually quite early, it's 1828 by an architect called uh, John Earl. And um, you would think, well, that's a little Georgian chapel, all quite sweet, but it doesn't prepare you for what you see inside, um, which is this. And, and this is just really quite extraordinary. Um, so first of all, if you're dealing with um, you know, a late Georgian church, and actually you can see there some of the columns, the only columns, and the actual structure of the church is actually Georgian. The classical elements that you can see um, are part of the earlier church. But actually in 1894, so late 19th century, um, an Austrian um, uh, architect designer um, called Immenkamp, um, I'm not quite sure how he arrives in Hull, but he does, and he creates this extraordinary sort of Baroque, Austrian Baroque, I don't know, Sicilian Baroque interior. And um, so you have this sort of hidden light coming in, daylight, sunshine, coming in from the top and sort of creating this extraordinary sort of cascade of light, very sort of Baroque idea. And then you kind of look at um, what's above the high altar and the clouds and the rays and all of that. And do you know what that's made of? I mean, if this was Italy, that would all be sort of marble and goodness knows what. It's actually made of um, melted tin. And um, paint and tin. And there's another feature you kind of get in a lot of Catholic churches is that there's that alongside all this grandeur, there's very often sort of um, quite a lot of corner cutting and creating great scenes of grandeur, but they're sort of, you know, but, but really done quite cheaply. Um, here's another view of the same, the same, the same thing. And um, then here, again, you can see to the bones of a Georgian chapel there, um, but then all hugely overlaid with, with, with um, all this decoration. Uh, well worth a visit, now listed uh, grade one. Um, so moving on, uh, this is Holy Rood in Watford, and here I just wanted to introduce another of the great Catholic architects in this country that's produced, uh, John Francis Bentley. And um, Bentley is essentially, he's a late goth, and uh, I mean this is one of his, one of his, um, one of his masterpieces really, and uh, um, here we have the, you know, the interior. You can see the inspiration he has from Pugin uh, with his, with his rood. Um, Bentley is, is really, really important, not only as the, obviously the designer of Westminster Cathedral, but for really his sense of colour, and um, he, he particularly his interiors, um, which are always where the colours have remained and, 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 and survived, absolutely stunning. Uh, and I think you had, the, was the pulpit here? In St Anne's, I think, was designed by Bentley, wasn't it? And I know that there's a scheme afoot to, 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 to reuse parts of it, and it was removed some, some time ago. Um, but um, here, here we have uh, the actual um, cross itself, and here is the um, high altar. And it's every little detail, attention to every kind of detail. You look at the steps, you look at the inlay, um, you, look at, you, look, you look at wherever you look, there's just wonderful colours. And the richness um, here is the, um, the, the, the rare loss 
of the use of gold. I mean, look at the decoration of that, of that tabernacle. Um, and he designed absolutely everything at Watford. Again, a church really well, well worth um, going to have a look at, every single detail. And um, here's the, uh, the Lady Altar again. Um, and you can see, we're going to come on to Westminster Cathedral in a minute, but you can sort of start to see the sort of bones of the, you know, the steps and the design of those, um, some of the ideas that he was to develop further. But as I say, every little detail of Watford is designed by Bentley. These are the, the light fittings, um, incredibly uh, beautiful. And, uh, and then, of course, the glass as well. Um, here's, here's, here's one of the windows which actually illustrates um, uh, the church itself. So we then, from there, uh, we move on to um, Westminster Cathedral. And the whole story of Westminster Cathedral is so interesting because, because um, you know, there was the opportunity to, to build what was going to be a major Catholic cathedral in central London. And the land originally had to be bought because there was still a lot of anti-Catholic feeling. I mean, you have the reinstatement of the hierarchy in 1850 and you know, cartoons in the Times about you know, the Pope sort of you know, taking over England. There was a lot of anti-Catholic feeling. It didn't result in, any, in, any, in anything being burnt down or anything by that date. But, but nonetheless, it was all sort of a bit sensitive. And the land on which the cathedral was now, now built was actually acquired by three different independent private people. Uh, who the, the, the fear was that it actually it appeared the Catholic Church was actually about to buy a very large site in central London. There would be a lot of opposition and it would be blocked. And nobody knew initially that, that actually their her aim was to accumulate a site big enough to build um, what is now Westminster Cathedral. So the original plan, um, the, the, so there was a competition and a lot of people applied for it and Bentley won the competition. His original plan, which the drawing exists, was actually for a Gothic style. Um, cathedral, but also in brick and with the white stone dressings, but designed in the Gothic style. But the decision was taken that actually they really needed to be something quite different because, of course, you've got Westminster Abbey down the road, which is Gothic, and then there was you know, also, you know, if it was to be classical, well, you know, was that really appropriate? And so the decision was taken, and Bentley was asked to design a Byzantine, um, Romanesque strokes of Byzantine cathedral, which is what you've got, which is, I mean, just to tell him to do it, he'd never been to Istanbul, he never, he did try and go, he never got there, but he did go and visit quite a lot of other places and studied Byzantine architecture. Um, and so you have this incredibly original building built. Um, 1895 it started, it gets finished in the, in the early 19th century. Well, I say finished, of course it isn't finished. Um, and um, there it is today. And uh, as you know, any of you have been there, which I'm sure many of you have, there is still a huge amount of mosaics still to be completed. The programme of doing mosaics continues as funding allows, and most of the side chapels, all of the side chapels now are fully, fully have their mosaics in place. Um, Bentley didn't design anything, you know, he just left it as a shell. And so as time goes on, uh, the aim is to, to um, eventually, the whole building should be like St. Mark's in Venice and fully covered in mosaics. Sort of thing. When that will happen, who knows? That's just a detail um, of the interior and its, its amazing richness. And then, of course, um, it has these, these, these wonderful stations of the cross uh, all around the cathedral. Of course, they're you know, slightly controversial, like they're designed by Eric Gill. And there was a bit of a fuss and a bit of concern. I was asked on the Times, wasn't it, about three weeks ago, but immediately after that statue um, on the BBC building um, got damaged, just to, you know, should, should Westminster take, you know, take these out? Um, should there be you know, a debate about that? And uh, I think the general view is that, that, that you, know, you can have wonderful art and you can have very bad artists and, and Caravaggio and people, you know, who's been murdered people and things. I mean, you know, they are very, very fine. Um, so um, you know, that's, they, will, they, will, they will remain there. But the influence of, of Byzantium and Hagia Sophia is, is obviously something that, that certainly by the turn of the century um, is, is sort of running as a running theme through, um, through Catholic architecture. And this is uh, St. John the Baptist in Rochdale, uh, now listed a uh, grade two star, 1924. Um, it's sort of, you know, almost mosque-like, but then I think mosques actually sort of owe their antecedents, don't they, I think, to Hagia Sophia and the Dome and so forth. Um, and um, inside, so this is 19, uh, 1924. Um, but again, you know, wonderful mosaics. In, in this church, really, really in, impressive. In terms of styles, by the time you get to about 1900, um, this, 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 you know, instead of just classical and Gothic, and now, now we talk about Byzantium, you know, you get, you get other, you know, styles kind of coming in. I mean, your own cathedral here is a wonderful arts and crafts building of 1902, 
and uh, but it's in an arts and crafts style. It's, it is vaguely Gothic, but it is really beautifully reinterpreted in the arts and crafts tradition. Um, but, but equally, you know, other styles kind of come in. Um, this is an Alphesian farm, and this is Giles Gilbert Scott, um, and so um, again, part of that Scott dynasty, also obviously very Catholic designs. I mean, he's the, he's the architect, of course, of the great power stations, Battersea Power Station, and uh, what is now Tate Modern. Uh, and um, but also a designer of, of Catholic churches. And here's this brilliant essay in the Italian Romanesque with its baldacchino, um, with its arches. And these lovely sunbursts, the light fittings are these extraordinary sunbursts. So again, there's attention to detail. And um, again, another rather remarkable feature out of this church is this floor. So it's in the spirit of a Cosmati Italian um, floor. Um, any guesses as to what it's made of? Lime. It's made of lino, yes, it's made of little squares of lino, which again sort of echoes this point about whether they could possibly afford, you know, marble to make a stone cosmati floor. So they chop up little bits of lino, and, um, and, and there it is. Um, it looks terrific, actually. It's, it's quite damaged by Sedetto heels over the years, um, 1925, and they've now got some money to, to restore the floor, um, I've heard recently, so um, that's, um, um, that's very, very good news. Um, but in terms of styles, um, as you move into the 20th century, the styles get sort of more weirder and wonderful and, and so forth. Um, um, this little church, Lovey Law Haiti, is Our Lady Star of the Sea, appropriately overlooking the sea, um, at Anglesey. In Anglesey. And here we have you know, a really modernist, beginnings of the sort of modern movement and the modernist period, uh, made of concrete, designed by an Italian architect who moved to North Wales called Giuseppe Rinvalucri. And um, Rinva Lucre had actually spent, it's, it's 1933, so this, 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 this is pre-war, and he actually started his career in Turin, working in the car industry and aviation industry, designing you know, motor cars and that sort of thing. And you can sort of, sort, of, sort of begin to see some of that early design, because the Italians were sort of brilliant with their early car designs and that sort of thing, beginning to, um, beginning to, to, to influence his, his, his buildings. So it's reinforced concrete. And um, it's lit in this way with these big chunks of coloured glass, plain and coloured and blue glass. Um, blue obviously is a different room in terms of sort of dedication to Our Lady. Um, and the bits of glass are set into the concrete. Um, it has all sorts of uh, fabric issues because there's the reinforcing rods and so forth, rust, and water seeps in through those through those rather amazing bits of glass. Um, but it is just all those little stars, just the stars I don't know going over the Round the sanctuary, also in glass, um, and just all rather amazing. Um, and um, and then in the northwest, you have the architecture of a very remarkable architect called Francis Xavier Bellardi. Books just come out about Bellardi, and he worked pretty well exclusively in the northwest. Um, and this is St Monica's in Bootle. And uh, um, I, I mean, I, you know, we talk about Giles Scott and his power stations, but there is um, an element of some of these buildings of the 1930s, which you know, I talk about sort of power station architecture, and there is something of, of that, you know, that solid brick um, that does, does, you know, is this a Catholic church or is it something else? But it very definitely is a Catholic church, uh, St. Monica's. And um, it, it's just really rather remarkable. You know, a very idiosyncratic style of Alardi, um, and uh, very, very original. And uh, those are the angels on the outside. Uh, inside uh, there is the, the sanctuary, um, and uh, there's all well worth, well worth visiting. I mean, another of his churches, pretty plain on the outside, 1952, so into the post-war period now. This is English masters in Wallasey. They're all up in, the north, up in the northwest. And that rather sort of plain, perhaps rather severe exterior, um, inside, uh, here is the sanctuary. And his love of colour and the interesting mix of, of the use of sort of silver and aluminium colours, um, uh, together with this sort of brick, dark brick, and uh, um, that's um, essentially the Last Supper, going okay? into a kind of form of rare loss up the back there. Um, just all rather remarkable, that's the font. Um, it's using gold. It's, it's really interesting use of colour. Uh, that's the, the ceiling um, to the choir. Uh, and, um, so Velardi, a very interesting Catholic architect. Um, now we're well into, um, now we're now sort of into the, into the post-war period. Um, and uh, moving on, um, so, um, this is The Good Shepherd at Woodthorpe, 1961, um, and it's by Jerry Cogan, again a fine Catholic architect, and uh, something that almost resembles a minaret really there, isn't it? It's extraordinary, really. 
Um, but this is a really good example of the use of what's called dans de verre, which was a French technique, um, much emulated in Catholic churches in this country and also in America, where, I'm going back to the Rome Lucre building, but where you set big chunks, thick chunks of coloured glass in the concrete and resin, um, and created effectively walls of glass. And this is, um, as I say, good, 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 good shepherd at Woodfall. This is Patrick Rentians, who was a well-known uh, glass designer at the time, who you know, pioneered a lot of this. Uh, and of course, you know, with, with sunlight streaming through, you get these sort of sensational colours and so forth. And so Rentians was one of the sort of key exponents of this. And then with the new towns being built and new Catholic churches being needed, this is Our Lady of Fatima in Harlow, Harlow New Town, by another Catholic article. Um, this, is, this is also Gerald Goldman. And uh, um, one of the problems we begin to see here with so many of these modern, more modern buildings is that um, they were so experimental and experimental designs. And just at the moment, I mean, there's a real worry about that spa, which is sort of a fair sort of flight of clad with um, copper. And uh, of course, you know, talking about um, the early 60s, uh, but that all needs to be replaced. Um, at the moment, it's only used to grade two, and I think it's a strong case. For this church, a wonderful church to be upgraded to grade two stars, stand much better chance of getting a grant. Um, but here is the Dal de Bear glass, it's all, all this church is full of this stuff. Um, and this is Don Charles Norris, who was a great glass uh, monk, monk who designed all this um, glass at Buckfast, which some of you may know. Uh, magnificent uh, work here at, 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 at Harlow. And um, uh, interestingly, Sir Frederick Gibbert, who was the actual architect of Harlow Newtown, apart from this church went to the, um, um, the, the mass that celebrated the um, consecration of this church. And he actually, well, he wasn't Catholic, but he was so impressed by, by everything he saw. And um, we'll come on to um, um, Liverpool in a moment. And at the time, Liverpool's, there was the competition for Liverpool Cathedral. And he was so impressed by the Catholic church designed by Dolan that he, well, he, well, he, he, um, he put in for the, in for the competition and then won it. Um, but this is just a sort of side aside. Um, uh, this is St. Francis of Assisi in Ely in Cardiff. It's on the outskirts of Cardiff, it's a very, very poor neighbourhood. And it's just very simple to how the 1960s is a very typical 1960s modernist church. Um, and, um, and it's really it's really quite fine in its in its design, but I mean familiar probably with the sort of style of church which many of you will be familiar with, and it was a great boom of Catholic church building. Uh, particularly around places like Liverpool, but all over the country in the 1960s. Um, and you know, this, this kind of um, modern artwork on the outside. Um, I mean, inside, it's, it's really just sort of hallmark. It, there's nothing perhaps in terms of its internal design that's particularly remarkable architecturally. But it does have this astonishing um, sequence of tiled stations of the cross. It's like a sort of theatre gallery, already all the way around there. And they're all tiles, and they're all the stations of the cross. I've never actually seen that in any other church, where they're not fixed to the wall, but they go in this kind of uh, semicircle around um, on this kind of gallery. And these are by um, a Polish monk called Adam Kozowski, who, who, who was sort of just did these tiled figurative panels, and did them in a number of places, including um, uh, Aylesford, the, the shrines of Aylesford, the shrine, shrine chapels of Aylesford. Um, are all, are all um, full of these wonderful tiles, this kind of, um, and Dianside also has an altar um, by um, Kazowski. But um, moving on to Liverpool, Liverpool Met. Um, so Sir Frederick Gibbert, having designed Harlow New Town, had been hugely impressed by uh, the, 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 the Golden Church, um, Our Lady of Fatima in Harlow, wins the competition for Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral. So the background to this, as some of you will know, is that Lutchins, Sir Frederick Lutchins, has been commissioned before the war to create what would have been, I think, the, the second, I think it would have been the biggest church, probably after St. Peter's. I mean, it was the, the megalomania of the thinking of the 1930s in Liverpool was extraordinary. You know, the, the model exists, and the drawings exist of, of Dutchins' design. But the crypt, only the crypt was built. And so in the post-war period, there was never going to be funding to, to complete Dutchins' design. Um, interestingly, they chose Dutchins, who of course was an Anglican. Um, um, but anyway, they had this competition, and then they chose Sir Frederick Gibbard, who I think actually was a non-conformist to build Liverpool Met. And uh, there it is, um, had its wigwam or spaceship or whatever you want to, to refer to it as. It, it's almost the day it was built, it had all sorts of structural problems. I mean, that corona on the top meant to um, echo the crown of thorns um, is all delta there, as you'll see in a moment. 
and um, the combination of the sort of concrete and the resin, they have sort of untried, untested sort of mixture. And of course, this gets the full force of all the sort of sea winds and so forth from the Mersey, and this caused all sorts of challenges. And there was no access up there. I mean, at least in the medieval period, they did design some staircases up towers, and you can actually, most of the time, get to most parts of medieval cathedrals. You can't get up there. And you can scaffold in that, and it's, you know, it really is kind of quite, quite something. Um, you can get condensation and all sorts of things, but that's the main entrance. I mean, it's an incredibly powerful design. Um, and uh, then inside, I mean, the, the, the light from the dud bare glass, I mean, it's just quite sensational on, on a sunny day. And, mm -hmm. and the sort of main floor of the church is in these blues, and then the corona at the top is in these um, reds and oranges and yellows. And this was a combination of, of Patrick Renchens, who I mentioned, um, and John Piper. They designed all this glass together, and it is a work of art. And actually, the challenge, the terrible condensation, um, I mean, the, the lot of the, 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 the smaller um, bits of concrete that, into which this glass is set were beginning to erode. And um, the whole question was then, well, well what do we do? How do we, how do we restore this? It is a work of art. You can't just take it all down and rebuild it, because it is not the same thing. So there's been a lot of research done on how this can be stabilized. And um, a significant grant was obtained, to, um, actually from the Getty Foundation, to really just look really, really carefully at how this work of art could be, could be stabilized and, and preserved, um, and uh, hopefully accessed as well. Um, but it's a remarkable building. Um, 1964, uh, Francis Pollan, another important architect, um, modernist architect, this is Worth Abbey, uh, in, um, a, a, attached obviously to, to, you know, to Worth School. And you see how it just sits within that landscape of the dams and so forth, and this incredibly dramatic interior. Very, very fine architect, Francis Pollan, who also designed the library at, um, at Dunside um, and part of the monastery there. And then scrolling forward again, um, this is Clifton Cathedral, 1969, Percy Thomas Partnership. And uh, again, there's sort of elements again of sort of power station type architecture, an extraordinary sort of interpretation of a spire. And then inside, um, you've got, it's all in concrete, um, and, and I mean, a really impressive space. And, uh, and around the walls, the stations of the cross are all um, cast in concrete. Um, and the floor, is beautiful tiles, and they put in electric underfloor heating, which they thought was the latest thing. And of course, I mean, it's always been far too expensive to run. So uh, um, there it sits, and you can't dig the floor up now, because they don't have heating in the floor, because it's a historic floor. So there's all sorts of issues with these modern buildings. Um, as you can imagine, that's just a detail of um, the stations of the cross. And there is uh, the pond again, more down to the hand glass. Um, so, scrolling forward again, they're just a bit more recent. The wheel, in a sense, goes full circle from this sort of overt modernism um, that we've just seen uh, to something like this. This is Brentwood Cathedral, so we're moving forward in 1989. And this was the great sort of um, collaboration between Bishop Thomas McMahon and Quinlan Terry, the neoclassical architect. And um, uh, there's the interior. And they did work very closely together. I mean, uh, Quinlan um, um, you know, listened a great deal um, in Anglican, but he listened to everything Bishop Thomas, so they worked very closely on the design. But what's interesting is we have, here we are back to the classical again, um, wheels turn full circle, um, with a very interesting sort of rendition of Renaissance, um, Florentine <coughs> Renaissance design. And then back to where we started almost in a sense, um, I don't know whether you know this remarkable chapel, this is the Cullum Chapel <coughs> near Henley, and um, this is a private chapel built by the Schwarzenbachs, quite recently, opened about five years ago, mm -hmm. uh, designed by Craig Hamilton, uh, who's a, again a classical architect. It's actually highly original, it's a very, it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's, it is a really interesting, interesting building, um, but as I say, we showed you those private chapels right at the beginning on the States, and you know, here we are five years ago, and, and, and that wheel is sort of, um, Craig's actually built about three private chapels in England, one, one's in Scotland, two in England. Um, and he designed absolutely every single detail, light fittings, pews, floor, even the vestments, um, the plate, absolutely everything for this, this chapel. So um, that brings us really kind of completely up to date. Um, I'm just going to end with a few slides of, of um, images of, of um, one or two sort of things that, and trends and things that, 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 that you know, maybe we're beginning to see here um, now. 
This is um, simply from Paul New Brighton, uh, on the, um, looking across the Mersey, it's on the tip of the Wirral. And uh, um, this is a church that closed, it's a great landmark, Mystic Grade 2, there are a lot of churches in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the Wirral. And the decision was taken that it was suffering from water coming in and you know, it was going to be too expensive to repair. And it was closed for about five or six years. And, uh, and actually, I think that the, uh, the Diocese of Shrewsbury, I think, probably thought they might be able to demolish it. But as you might imagine, being such a landmark, there was a huge outcry. And it was in the, you know, the Liverpool Echo for days and weeks and you know, even years, the campaign to save it. And it was eventually um, taken on by the Order of Christ the King, who are a traditionalist order. Um, there, there's the church. It actually looks very like the Lutchins building. And it was very clearly influenced, it was built just before the outbreak of the Second World War, influenced by Lutton's design of Liverpool Cathedral. And the parish priest who was determined to outdo Liverpool on the other side of the Mersey, he got this up before war broke out. And it's all concrete frame inside, very simple structure, clad in brick. But you can see the sort of shades of, of, of the Imperial of Delhi in those towers and so forth. Although he, he, he you know, he, he, he given Lutton's, um, sorry, given the architect not particularly well known. Um, uh, there's a model of a church in, in, um, in, in, I think in Portugal, actually in Lisbon, to, to follow. But anyway, it's, it, it really owes more to Lutchins than it does to, to anything else. Um, but it built in the 1930s, taken over by the Order of Christ the King about 15 years ago, who got enormous sums of money out of the lottery to fix the roof, and work is still going on on the dome. Um, but there's the, the high altar. And it's just quite interesting, this, because it's very beautiful colored marbles, very subtle colors of sort of grays and greens um, in the 1930s. And, and it had this terrible color scheme of orange and brown, which I think dates from the 70s. And literally just in the last six months, they have now um, had the money to, to, to repaint it to its original color scheme of sort of grays and blues. It's looking absolutely sensational. Um, but this, I just want to show you this, 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 and I'm moving on to Shrewsbury Cathedral. So this is a, a, a cathedral by E. W. Fugin, Fugin's son. And in the, it had a number of really pretty catastrophic reorderings, of which this was the latest, done in the, I think, the 80s, where they brought the altar forward and popped it on this sort of blue carpet. And it sort of never really worked, and people sort of fall over steps. And also it made, it actually, because it was brought forward, it actually made the space of the cathedral very constrained. And um, Bishop Mark Davis has been you know, concerned about this for some time. And anyhow, um, um, we asked sort of advice, and we, we looked into the history of the, of, of the church, and it did once originally have this wonderful, <coughs> all these wall paintings and this figurative scheme all around. There's a lot more photographs, very well photographed. Um, and actually using these early photographs and doing a lot of research, we worked out that, and also that we you know, took up that blue carpet. Um, and under which there was still the Victorian floor was almost all still there. And somebody had put a bit of trunking through part of it, but it's all, it's all repairable. And there's now a scheme, um, just got a faculty last week, to, uh, to actually, you know, sit whilst the altar's now come out, they've been experimenting with how they're going to put up the forward altar just a bit further back and re 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 redesign the sanctuary. And the ultimate aim is to, is to try and recover, they've done some paint scrapes, and all these paintings are all there underneath, underneath the paint. So you know, in an ideal world, if there's funding, it would be really good to, re to restore all that. But very exciting, they needed a new high altar. Um, so you know, that's a pretty expensive thing just to sort of go out and, and commission. And actually just recently, an altar, 19th century altar at Ely Cathedral was being taken, it's being taken out, and it didn't really fit in the normal, the normal side chapels, and they didn't want it. It's beautiful, uh, dark um, red and orange alabaster. And uh, I just happened to get to hear about it, and I got hold of um, Bishop Martin, I said, you know, this, this not my work, and it's exactly the right size. Yeah. And so it's giving it, and it's sort of really the right, you know, an appropriate date, lovely colour, um, doesn't need an awful lot doing to it, and so that will soon now be installed um, in, Tro in Trojbury Cathedral. And I think what I'm really thinking about saying is that a number of our churches are now wanting to undo the damage of Vatican II, where things were just ripped out. Vatican II coincided, sadly, with a period when really Victorian architecture was not appreciated. So it was a little nadir of that sort of thing. People thought Victorian architecture was very ugly and you know, places like St Pancras Station where they got demolished. It's hard to remember that now, but they did. Um, a lot of our churches were badly damaged. They weren't listed at the time. And I think a lot of that is now deeply regretted. And we see a lot of applications now, um, actually for people trying to uncover floors, put back things, put back details, rescuing broken details they find in crypts sometimes buying them from um, antique dealers or salvage yards where they've been rediscovered. 
Um, so it's quite an interesting, an interesting trend. It's exactly the moment when the Church of England is pretty well ripping out the pews out of every single church it owns. Um, we're seeing something very different happening um, in the Catholic Church. So I've nearly finished. Um, and uh, just to say really at the end, for those of you who want to find out more about our Catholic heritage, for the last 15 years we've been working on a programme now complete with Historic England to record and write up and photograph um, every single Catholic church uh, in England and Wales. It's part of a project called Taking Stock. It's all on, we've now covered all the dioceses. We started in Lancaster, now from Brighton, worked on through, and then finally got some funding to cover Wales, which was the last um, um, area to be covered. It's all now on the web um, through the Patrimony Committee. You just Google Taking Stock, um, or Taking Hyphen Stock, or Taking Stock Catholic Churches. It will take you straight there. It's all ordered by diocese, um, and then you can, you can look up by diocese and then look up um, your, your place of worship you want and find out about its architecture and its history. Um, and one of the reasons for doing that is, 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 is a lot of Catholic churches are either underlisted or not listed at all, missing out on grants, and um, by getting them properly reviewed, uh, so I'm going to be working through all these reports. And we've seen a significant number of, of new listings and upgradings uh, throughout, throughout, um, throughout England. And now Wales hopefully will follow will follow on from there. And then just back to St Walberts, um, this amazing church. Uh, just really to say that just recently uh, Josephine, who's here, and Fergus, who's here, and I are deeply involved in um, the Cultural Recovery Fund uh, Capital Grants Program. So a lot of money was made available by the government as part of the Cultural Recovery in view of after um, you know, during COVID. Uh, to fund all the arts organisations, revenue funding, but a certain amount of money was given to Historic England to fund capital repairs, to promote employment, to keep craft skills going, and of course, most importantly, to repair buildings. And uh, the criteria of the building had to be able to the public, so that included churches, they had to be grade one, grade two star. So this programme began in the summer of 2020, and we had phase one, and now we have phase two, and we are well on the through with phase two. And in that really quite short period of time, we've been successful in getting um, over 6.6 .6 million pounds from this grant scheme to spend on churches in England. So we've been running about nearly 50 projects um, uh, that we've uh, been able to grant fund. And very excitingly, um, so um, a church like this, we see how steep that roof is, and it's got little nail sick on after 150 years or whatever, the, the nails held in these enormous space, and they just rot and they just rust. And so um, currently at the moment, it's being re-roofed. One whole side of it is being re-roofed. There's not enough money to do the whole of it, but one major side of St. Walberts is currently being re-roofed. Very pleased, I phoned them up yesterday. I said, the, the scaffolding is up right now. I mean, that's, that's a view of it right now. You can see how steep it is. Um, anyway, it survived the storms. Um, what nearly didn't survive the storms, but um, this is my last slide. Um, there's that cross that I mentioned right at the very beginning, right on top of the, um, of the west front. And when they got the scaffolding up there, they realised that it had cracked in several places and was really at the point of falling off. Fortunately, they took it down about two weeks ago. Oh. And it's going to be repaired and it'll go back up. Um, but thank goodness, because that would have come crashing down in the recent, um, in the recent storms. Uh, so um, it's very exciting with all these projects going, and Fergus and, 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 and Joe and I and I we couldn't do it in 2020 because of lockdown, but we're actually beginning to get out and see some of the work that's been done. And we've been up to Britain today um, to see you know, the, the, the work that was funded there in the last phase, and also a little bit of work here, which was funded. Important things like the fire alarm system, um, and the, you know, which, which needed a certain amount of upgrade, and these grants have been, as well as doing repair work, have actually been able to put to really practical things like, like um, making sure that the, 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 there is proper fire protection and that kind of thing. So it's been a fantastic grant scheme, and we're very much hoping that, that when this is over as Historic England, we'll continue with some sort of funding like that, because actually it's going to keep these places open and in good repair. You know, government funding really is, really is needed, and we need to get our share of it. The Anglicans usually do incredibly well, and we've generally been less good at getting the grants. Um, and we're very clear that, uh, that that mustn't continue, but I think this recent grant scheme has been really important in showing that we, that we can actually you know, do these huge projects and do them well. That's the really key thing. I think that's really all um, I'm going to say today. And uh, I take any questions if anyone wants to ask any questions. Okay.